After narrowly avoiding capture in December of 1975, the Visalia Ransacker's crime spree appeared to end abruptly. Around that same time, Joe D'Angelo began a new job at the Auburn Police Department, 250 miles away. It's the next stop on my journey, retracing the steps of the man alleged to be the Golden State Killer, to talk with people who knew and worked with him. Nicholas Willick, now retired, was a lieutenant with the Auburn Police Department when D'Angelo was hired. What were your impressions of him just personally during that period of time? Joe was a little odd, a little different. He would talk to himself. He would, uh, you know, go down the, you know, the hall. And you can hear him mumbling to himself. So sounds like he was just sort of socially awkward too. Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd say that. Yes, we tried, but uh, it, there was some awkwardness in it. In June of 1976, several months after D'Angelo and his wife moved to Auburn, a woman sleeping in Rancho Cordova, 25 miles away, awoke to find a masked man standing over her, holding a knife. He robbed and sexually assaulted her. Investigators would later say that the Visalia ransacker, no longer content with targeting empty houses, had committed his first rape. What you see when you're dealing with an offender you do commonly see them escalate and go through a series of known steps from being peepers to being burglars to ultimately going hands-on and sexually assaulting the women. Over the next several months, other women in the area were attacked in the same way. It wasn't until the fifth rape did investigators, including Richard Shelby and Carol Daly, realize they were dealing with a serial offender. He soon became known as the East Area Rapist. When did you first start investigating the East Area Rapist? October 1976. That was Jane Carson, home invasion, woman sexually assaulted. Her husband left for work like 6.30 in the morning, and he was no more in the car and down the street, and this guy came through his, the son's bedroom window and came in and accosted her. He had that timing perfect. Daly, one of the only female investigators on the case, personally interviewed nearly every victim of the East Area Rapist in her jurisdiction. Can you describe for me what the MO was for the East Area Rapist? The East Area Rapist always wore a ski mask, always had gloves, always spoke through clenched teeth in, in a very harsh whisper, always had a weapon, always confronted the victim, usually shining a flashlight into their eyes and having them turn over and tying the victims up. And many times when he walked in and confronted a victim, it said, I'm not gonna hurt you, I just want your money. But then when he would come back and start untying them, they knew that he wasn't there just for the money. From October of 1976 until April of 1977, 10 more women were raped, bringing the victim count to 15. He prowled and prowled and prowled and broke in, sometimes breaking in two or three nights in a row before he attacked the people. Instead of making a quick getaway, the East Area Rapist would take his time. For two, sometimes three hours, he lingered in the house. It's a long time, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, he'd been there a long time. One victim, he walked by and he kept snapping, or clipping the uh, scissors in her face, just trying to taunt her. He, he's just a mean bastard. He often would eat the victim's food. Sometimes he would take the food and the beer out on the patio and sit in the lawn chairs and just eat away while the victims were left bound inside the house. Again, what does that tell you about him? It's another way to exert control. Now, this is my house now. I've got power and control over this whole dwelling. Now, I'm going to prove it because I'm going to eat now. And in between, he was always coming back to make sure that they had not moved. He would tell them, don't move, don't move, or I'm going to kill you. Once word of the attacks hit the papers, the community was in an uproar. Panic, fear in the community like I have never, ever seen uh, because we hadn't caught him. I have a gun under my bed at all times. Guns were flying off from the shelves. Thousands of guns were sold at that time. Locks, you couldn't go into a hardware store and buy a lock. People were nailing their windows shut. All you can do is take every possible precaution and then hope that he gets caught before he gets to you.